Hello, friends and fellow Alexers. Thank you for joining our tech talk today. I'm Yuri, and today I'll be talking about the concept called the circle of life, what it means and how to use it for our own uh, benefit in software engineering. But first, uh, why should you listen to me? Within my 10 plus years career, I've been working with a number of tools and uh, technologies. I've been a team leader and a team manager, returned to the development roles, worked in a number of product and uh, outsource companies. Uh, during this time, I did all mistakes imaginable, and therefore I'm ready to share what I have learned from them. So in this talk, I will refer a lot the Clean Architecture and the Clean Agile uh, books, both authored by Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob. You may know him as the author of the popular Clean Code book as well. He is a member of the Snowbird meeting where Agile Manifesto was originally written. I'm going to talk about it shortly. And uh, also the one who originally assembled the solid principles in his paper in year uh, 2000. So I'm really taking the information from the original source. In um, um, in February of uh, 2001, a group of 17 software experts gathered in uh, Snowbird, Utah to talk over the um, deplorable state of the software development uh, at that time. Most software um, was done using um, ineffective, heavyweight and highly ritual rigid processes like a waterfall. The Agile Manifesto was written there and uh, therefore one of the most potent and long-lived movements in the software field was born. Unfortunately, once a movement becomes popular, the name of that movement gets uh, blurred through misunderstanding and uh, somehow usurpation. This event was gathered 17 software engineers. No managers, no business people, they were engineers. And um, so here's the trick. There are many techniques for running a software project. And um, yet most often than not, uh, they have tendency to fail. And the reason they fail so spectacularly is that the managers who use them do not understand the fundamental physics of software projects. The physics contains all the projects uh, to obey a trade-off called an iron cross of the project management. Good, fast, cheap, and done. Pick any three you like. You can't have the force. You can have a project that is good, fast, and cheap, but uh, it won't get uh, done. You can have a project that's done and cheap and fast, but it won't, get, uh, won't be any good. The reality is that a good PM understands that there are four attributes and they have coefficients, right? So they are not Boolean. A good manager drives the project to be good enough, fast enough, cheap enough, and done as much as necessary. Also, good managers um, manage these coefficients, uh, these attributes uh, raisers and demanding all of them to be 100 percent this is a kind of uh, project running style that agile strive strives to enable so why do i talk about managers to you engineers because it is an engineering job and responsibility to make good projects and to help your managers Strictly speaking, Agile does not give you the rules. It just gives a vague guidance or a direction for individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. That's it. Do whatever you want with the statements. But what actual instruments does uh, it gives you or recommends you to fulfill the statements? Well, it gives you the circle of life. 
it describes the practices and principles of an agile. To be honest, it's actually even more specific. It describes the principles of extreme programming, which is in turn is one of the funding elements of an agile. Thanks to uh, a dude named Kent Beck, who also invented the uh, TDD practice. Test driven development. So this list of practices here is grouped in four, where the outer circle represents the business practices, middle circle is team practices, and the inner, uh, those are technical practices. The business practices are essentially Scrum. These practices provide the framework for the way the sort of development team communicates with the business and the principles by which the business and development team manage project. It's the most commonly known, accepted and used practice, um, mostly because they are targeting directly people who are in charge of the projects, like project managers, delivery managers, customer stakeholders, and uh, etc. Clearly, those people do their best to deliver the project and therefore they're using whatever tools they can to, uh, to deliver. Naturally, I will not stop on this much as I expect that you guys already know all to be known about this practice. The middle ring is more interesting to, uh, to us. It represents the team facing practices. These practices provide the framework and principle by which development team communicates with and manages itself. Let's uh, look closer, starting with the sustainable pace. So what you currently see on your screens is the first ever, uh, is a picture of the first ever expedition to reach the geographic South Pole. It was led by the Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen and uh, four others. He and four others uh, arrived at the uh, pole on 14th of December 1911, not too far back. Uh, but the scene is five weeks ahead. Uh, he did it five weeks ahead of the British party led by the Robert Scott. Amundsen and Scott were effectively um, uh, racing to become the first person to reach the South Pole. Amundsen have won and safely returned to his base, became an explorer superstar of a time, traveled the world with his lectures about the expedition and wrote his name in the history book. Scott and his team and country died on the rock bank uh, from the pole. The two expeditions took a very different approach to making progress. Scott, the British explorer, decided to make as much progress as uh, his team could uh, during the good weather days. And uh, on uh, bad weather days, uh, they would find intense. Um, on the good days, he was really pushing his team uh, to the limits to get as much distance as physically possible. Amundsen make, uh, made a rule not to move more than 25 kilometers a day. Good or bad weather, they were making steady progress every single day. They were sometimes making less uh, than a target on a bad weather days, but making progress regardless. On the good days, they would stop and break a camp as soon as they reached the target. Even on the last part, um, the weather was really good and the distance was about 75 kilometers. If they pushed, they could actually make it in a day. They did it in three. Instead, by sticking to the schedule, they put on themselves. When squad team reached the pole and found that Norwegian flag uh, was already there, and realized they were five weeks late. The team was exhausted, demoral, uh, demoralized, and uh, without any will or strength to return safely to the base. The story of told is about importance of the sustainable pace. In the same way, you never see soldiers running towards the target, but cautiously walking in a quick, sustainable pace. You should not resort to hack it through a SAP and fix it up later, at least not as a default option. 
sustainable pace give you a time to implement things well but also the uh, it gives the stakeholders the possibility to uh, and a clear picture for the planning um Yeah, um, so the achieving the sustainable pace uh, is why we are tracking the team's velocity. That's why we are doing estimations. A number of years ago, I worked in a product company in uh, a core team and uh, lots of responsibility and kind of pressure was uh, put on our team because the importance and uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, fail, uh, uh, fail responsibility that uh, or fail consequences that uh, uh, were on our team's uh, shoulders. And this company was um, tracking uh, the progress uh, of the team since this kind of uh, velocity a, a lot. So they, they were really into tracking those estimated times and uh, reaching the goals. Uh, while other teams would often um, have uh, the goals under delivered during the sprints and sprints were really short they were like one week long our team was uh, almost always uh, delivering what we promised and it was not uncommon for us to over deliver to give like more store uh, more tickets and more story points than we initially planned However, in order to do this, we were very cautious on uh, how much uh, tasks and how much story points do we take into the sprint. Uh, at the beginning of uh, the sprint uh, uh, on plannings, we would calculate our velocities. Of course, we knew our uh, velocity historically as it should be. Uh, and we would adjust it based on our uh, plans for the week. Uh, for example, if someone would have a day off or there would be a, a short day, we would, of course, reduce a few story points from uh, what we were planning to take. But also, if uh, we had scheduled big meetings uh, uh, with uh, other teams for management or uh, any something like this, we'd also uh, consider that this is something that takes out our capacity to deliver and would subtract few story points for each such event. But uh, as a result, and yes, of course, uh, we would never, ever, not a single time, uh, we took more story points into the sprints than our estimated calculated velocity for, for the next one. And as a result, we were uh considered as a most effective team and uh even won uh, a monetary compensation for the team at the end of, uh, of the year it was uh it was an important uh experience uh, also those who worked with me on the same project uh, can also remember that uh, i usually ask team what tickets should we take out of the upcoming sprint while stakeholders were trying to squeeze as much as possible Next is the collective ownership, and it's an important one. Any member of the team can check out and approve any model in the project at any time. The team owns the code collectively. Collective code ownership in simple terms is sharing the code and design responsibility among the team members. A sole developer who is working on a piece of module in a non-trivial project should consider letting other team members to look into their code and do necessary refactoring and changes and whatever. It is inevitable that someone would not be around for whatever reason. Either they are sick or uh, that someone has important appointment to attend to. And when maintaining an existing system, it is unavoidable to have a defect. With a collective ownership, any programmer can pitch in and apply the fix as soon as possible. In simple words, we want to raise the bus factor as high as possible. 
The bus factor is a number of key developers that need to be hit by a bus to kill a project. Of course, deaths under the public transport is not the only reason of losing team members. People change jobs, getting a vacation, sick leaves, etc. But uh, still, as long as they are missing and you have a critical situation and uh, only a single developer has expertise how to work with that module, well, you're in trouble. It also creates a discipline programmers. Collective code ownership forces a programmer to write a better code, as he knows that someone is watching him. Always think that uh, one who will check your code is a psychopath who knows where you live. You have to be more careful when writing the codes uh, in this case. Code reviews is one of the practices to implement the collective ownership but also a uh, pair program or even, uh, even more programming. So many of you were doing the discipline at least partially without realizing it. On top, uh, off top, the um, decent unit test coverage becomes a tool for you to explore the code base more safe as you're less likely to break something unintentionally. But back to the main topic. Um, this collective ownership, it applies not only to the codes of your team, but also to all teams. It is okay for you to make changes in uh, the services or code, uh, uh, code base or modules uh, owned by other teams when it is required by your task. Ask them to do a code review. Let them know that you made a change, but God, please do not wait for the three sprints for them to take your task to work just because they have other priorities and whatever you have on a plate. Moving next to continuous integration. In the early days of uh, an Agile, the practice of continuous integration meant that developers checked in their code, uh, uh, the source code changes and merged them uh, with the main line um, every couple of hours. All unit tests were and acceptance tests kept passing. No feature branches remained unintegrated. Any changes that should not be active when deployed uh, were dealt with uh, uh, by using toggles. In modern days, uh, the term of continuous integration got merged and mixed closely with the continuous delivery and kind of got more from the continuous delivery perception. But the process that I've described still lives, so it's uh, under a slightly different name. Uh, I guess you already figured it out. Uh, those are principles of the trunk-based development. Out of this, um, actually grow a continuous build uh, practice. When you have a continuous build, it's also very tempting to deploy it to the production, or at least to whatever environment is safe enough. Uh, therefore, CI/CD practice was born. But let's focus on the continuous build part. Continuous build should never break. Mike Tu, uh, an architect in Thoughtworks, he addressed this issue in uh, his lecture. Uh, he described uh, the calendar they put um, in a prominent position uh, on the wall in their team room. It was like one of these large posters that you uh, see as an example on the screens right now. Uh, the it had uh, a square for each day of the year. And um, every time uh, uh, and every day that they had a failed build, even once, they placed, uh, placed a red dot. In any day where the build never failed, they placed a green dot. And just that simple visual was enough to transform the calendar from mostly red dots into the uh, into a calendar with mostly green dots within like two months or so. And again, continuous build should never break. A broken build is a stop the press event. It means sirens going off, big red lights being in the CEO's office, and broken build is a big effing deal. All the programmers supposed to stop uh, what they are doing and rally around to build uh, to, to this build that uh, make to, to make it passing again. The mantra of the team must be the build 
never breaks. So the system is always, always in the working condition. There have been teams who, under the pressure of the deadline, have allowed the continuous build to remain in a fallen state. This is kind of a suicidal move. What happens is that everyone gets uh, tired of the continuous barrage of failure emails uh, from the uh, continuous build server like Azure DevOps, Jenkins, or whatever tool you're using. So they remove the fail, uh, failing tests. Uh, with the promise they will go and fix them later. Of course, this creates a continuous build server to start sending successful emails and everyone relaxes. The build is passing and everyone forgets about the pile of failing tests that were set aside to be fixed later. And so the broken system gets deployed. Do not buy into the lie of fixing later. Keep the build green and fix the broken build as soon as possible. Okay, we're almost done with the team practices, I promise. And once again, yeah, once again, this is the practice that create the vocabulary. And um, uh, vocabulary and the language that the team and the business use to communicate about the system, the metaphor. In his book, uh, Domain Driven Design, Eric Evans gave another term for this uh, uh, for this practice. He coined the term ubiquitous language. So it's hard to pronounce for me, so I prefer the metaphor term. What the team needs is a model of the problem domain, which is described in a vocabulary that everyone agrees on. And I mean like everyone, the programmers, QAs, managers, customers, users, everyone. Okay, so the innermost ring of the circle of life represents uh, technical practices that guide uh, and constrain the programmers to ensure the high, uh, highest technical quality. Those practices are interconnected, so let's discuss them in more details. And the first one is pairing. In uh, Ukraine, we have a proverb two hands are better than one. So it's exactly an example. Pairing is the act of two people working together on a single programming problem. The pair must work together at the same time, uh, as a, as a, uh, may work together at the same workstation, uh, sharing the screen or and the keyboard and mouse, or they may work on two connected workstations. So as long as they see and manipulate the same code base. You can share a screen, you can you can use tools or whatever, uh, but as long as you work uh, together on the same code base. So in pairing, programmers sometimes adopt different roles. One may be the driver and another is navigator, like uh, in a rally. Uh, the driver has a keyboard and a mouse and the navigator takes an longer view and makes recommendations. Another role option is um, for one programmer to write a test and another to make it pass and write a test for the first programmer. This is sometimes called the ping pong. Um, it's um, a lot of fun. Uh, it creates and destroys friendship as well. Most often, however, there are no roles at all. The programmers are simply co-equal authors, especially while using uh, code sharing software like CodeWithMe, which is my favorite. Um, also, this discipline is backing the collective ownership di discipline that we've talked before. After all, pairing is the best way by far to share the knowledge between team members and uh, prevent knowledge silos from forming. Excuse me. So uh, it is also the best way to make sure that nobody on the team is uh, indispensable. Pairing, um, pairing also replaces the contributors uh, because multiple people saw the code. 
the word pair implies that there are just two programmers involved in a pair session. While this is typically true, it's not a rule. Um, this is sometimes known as a mob programming when the whole group work together. You can you can gather as a team and uh, screen uh, screencast uh, your code to to the TV in the uh, in the meeting room or something like this, and you know uh, work on a code together. You can even do it uh, with a beer if it's uh, if it's Friday evening, and the company company policy allows it. Um, test driven development. This is a rich and complex topic, and uh, it will require an entire separate talk to cover properly. But uh, I'll try to keep it short. Accountants have a discipline that was invented about a thousand years ago. It's called double entry bookkeeping. Every transaction they um, enter in their books is entered twice. Once as a credit uh, in one set of accounts and um, again uh, as uh, a debit in another set of accounts. These accounts eventually flow into a single document called the balance sheet which subtracts the sum of liabilities and uh, equities from the sum of assets. The difference must be zero. If it's not zero, then an error has been made. This is, of course, the gross simplification. Uh, but as I said, let's keep it short. I personally am a graduate of economical faculty of Lviv University, and I can relate to this discipline uh, quite a lot. It was invented as a safety net from data errors. I mean, at the end of the line, you're working with a something of a monetary value. Accountants are taught in uh, early days of their uh, schooling to enter transactions one at a time and compute the balance sheet each time. This allows them to catch errors quickly. They are taught to avoid entering the bunch of transactions between balance checks, since then errors uh, would be hard to find. This practice is so essential so, to the proper accounting of um, monies that it has become a law in uh, effectively all parts of the world. Test-driven development is a corresponding practice for the programming. A um, remarkable experiment was conducted by Jason Gorman for uh, six days he was writing a simple program to convert integers into Roman numerals. He predefined a set of tests to know that uh, the work is done. Each day the task took him a bit less than 30 minutes to complete. Jason used test driven development on the first, third and fifth days. Uh, on other days he wrote code without TDD. Clearly, on later days, he finished tasks quicker than on the first days. But check this out now. Uh, you can see it on the graph on your screen. Not only the TDD days are always quicker than non-TDD, but also the slowest of the TDD days is quicker than the quickest of non-TDDs. So only way is to, uh, to go fast is to go well. Refactoring is another one of those topics that requires separate talk to describe. Fortunately, Martin Fowler has done a super job with uh, his book. Uh, this is called literally refactoring. The second edition has all the examples in JavaScript, uh, by the way. So the, the first edition, uh, which is uh, about 20 years older, uh, with examples with, uh, in Java. Uh, so everyone can find uh, edition that he's most comfortable with. If you do not have this book yet, I, you better buy one right now. Uh, you will also see that in this book, not only uh, he explains the refactoring patterns, but also how to pull them off step by step. And of course, it gives you a lot of training in writing in TDD style because he makes all the step by step uh, uh, refactoring using test driven development. Few things uh, have to be stressed out here. 
refactoring is about changing of the internal structure of the code without changing its functionality. So it's not same as rewriting the code. It's about making small incremental changes on the system that makes it better. Another thing is you do not have to ask permission to do this. It's part of the work by default. Follow the Boy Scout rule, leave the code you know, file and class or function or whatever in a better condition than when you found it. Do small incremental unnoticeable changes. I encourage you to keep it uh, in that way. And uh, the small, the small changes, they will accumulate over time and will make a code base, uh, code base better. So the process of refactoring is woven intricately into the three rules of the test driven development that we talked just a few minutes ago. Uh, it's known as uh, red green refactor cycle. First, we create a test that fails. Then we make the test that passes. Uh, we, we make this test to pass, right? Then we clean up the code. Then we repeat. The idea here is that writing code that works and writing code that is clean are two separate dimensions of the programming. Attempting to control both dimensions at the same time is, well, difficult at best. So we separate the two dimensions into two different activities. To say it differently, it is hard enough to get code working, let alone getting code to be clean. So we first focus on getting the code working by whatever messy means occur to your meager minds. Then once working with tests passing, we clean up the mess we made and tests are keeping keep passing. So they're already there. This makes it clear that refactoring is a continuous process and not one that is performed on a scheduled basis. We don't make huge mess for days and days and then try to clean it up. Razor, we make a very small mess or a period of minutes or two, and then we clean it up, or clean up the small mess. Uh, in a similar way as uh, accountants do enter one uh, entry at a time uh, and uh, do the balance uh, again. Uh, in fact, uh, those of you who uh, know how accountants work, maybe maybe have relatives or, or anything, or also do have some sort of economical education, you may know that in many companies uh, in the accounting departments, no one leaves uh, the workplace until the daily balance sheet is, uh, uh, is zero, which not only returns us to these gradual uh, steps, but also to the uh, green, uh, the, the build is always green uh, part. Those are very uh, corresponding practices in uh, in different, uh, but somehow similar industries. Um, because they, they do it because uh, if you try to enter your accounts for a week or for the whole month, and uh, it is mandatory for you, uh, for you in LTS in Ukraine to have uh, a monthly balance sheet. Um, well, and there are there is a problem, it's really, really hard to find it. You're going to have a pile of uh, pile of entries uh, that you have to check and it's really labor consuming. It's much easier to, to do a daily balances and then to combine them together. The same here uh, with, uh, with the test driven development uh, and the refactoring. We uh, do write tests and code in the same time and we run uh, the tests uh, all the time and uh, before it's merged to the main branch build is always screen so in case you have to do some big scale refactoring it's likely not refactoring but rewriting the code or a module uh, or changing the architecture it's not refactoring find an honest term of to what you're about to do. Often it's given uh, giving away the tech gap or working on elimination 
of some bugs that would otherwise be really, really hard to eliminate. Or maybe performance issues, mitigation. It's not refactoring. It's a separate activity that can and should be planned and executing according to the project's roadmap. Uh, but also please refer to the sustainable peace section for the explanation why it's important to take time and do such a things. But it's not refactoring. And uh, um, the final one here is a simple design. The practice of a simple design is one of the goals of refactoring. Simple design is a practice of writing only the code that is required with a structure that keeps it uh, simplest, smallest, and the most expressive. The designs of a software system range from quite simple to extraordinary complex. The more complex the design, the greater the cognitive load placed on the programmers. This cognitive load is called the design weight. The greater the weight of this design, the more time and effort it's required for programmers to understand and manipulate the system. Sometimes it's harder to achieve than say, however. But remember, we are doing software here and uh, we have to make it easy to change. In case it has to be hard to change, we would call it hardware. Um, there is another uh, uh, widely uh, recognized principle uh, for uh, simple design. Oh. It's the keys principle, but not this case. This case. Uh, keep it simple, stupid. Though it does not tell us how to achieve the simplicity. Would tell us how to achieve the simplicity. Uh, for example, solid principles. And uh, but it's a topic for our next meeting. So I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, I will be happy if you will leave your feedback. So we are thrilled to receive your feedback. I will provide the feedback form and I and Yuri are waiting for your feedback. And thank Yuri one more time because it was very interesting and your presentation and speech amazing. And if thank I you. heard you correctly, you announced your next tech talk about Solid, right? Yes. <laughs> Great. I am waiting. Okay, so guys, have a good evening and of course, uh, weekend are waiting for us. Just one day, just one Friday and we will have we <laughs> weekend. Okay, have a nice evening. Bye-bye.